Okay. Oh, it's okay. All right. I would like to call the meeting of the village board to order at seven thirty p.m. We have um, Trustee Ersink, Trustee Stokebrand, uh, Trustee Lynn, and Trustee McGovern with us this evening, and Trustee Kudo and Trustee Arndorfer are excused. Um, they are not on the, that's right. Um, has this meeting been publicly noticed? It has been properly noticed and posted according to law. All right. Well, welcome, everyone, and thank you for your time, talent, and patience in advance as we conduct business this evening. Um, I've had a request to move up um, the proclamation for Public Works Week in honor of the esteemed colleagues that are in our presence this evening. And to do that service for us to read the proclamation, I've asked um, the chair of Public Works, the esteemed trustee Ersink. I'm going to use the word esteemed as much as possible tonight. Good work. Uh huh. Uh, thank you, uh, to President McKeg, and uh, it is quite an honor to to be able to read this proclama proclamation to our fantastic employees here at the Department of Public Works, who do so many great things for our village. Um, all right. So, whereas Public Works services provide in the village of Shorewood are an integral part of our residents' everyday lives, and whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizens citizenry is vital to the uh, efficient operation of public works programs, including sewer and water systems, park and forestry maintenance, fleet and facilities maintenance, refuse collection, street maintenance and repair, traffic and streetlight systems maintenance, and winter operations. And whereas the health, safety, and comfort of our residents of the village of Shorewood greatly depends on these facilities and services. And whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities as well as their planning, design, and construction is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public works personnel, and whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who, who staff the Village of Shorewood's Department of Public Works is greatly influenced by residents' attitude and understanding of the importance of their work. Now, therefore, I, Anne McCullough McKeg, President of the Village of Shorewood, Milwaukee County, Wisconsin, do hereby proclaim the week of May 19th, 2024, as National Public Works Week in the village of Shorewood. And I call upon the residents and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing our public works and to recognize the contributions which public works officials make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. Dated at Shorewood, Wisconsin, this 20th day of May, 2024. <laughs> And I apologize, I came empty handed. I had a disconnect, but it I forgot it was Monday for a minute, but um, I'll try to drop something by a little token. Thank you very much. All right, um, moving on to special order of business, consider the statement of qualifications for the CBP3 model for lead service line and water main replacements. Um, this item comes to us from the Strategic Initiatives Committee um, and Manager Ewald with um, an update. So typically um, we ask the chair of the committee to sort of summarize, uh, recap the action or um, the uh, consensus of the committee moving this forward. Um, and in this case also, this is very procedural in or process related. And so if uh, Manager Ewald wants to add any comments as well. well so. Trustee McGovern. Sure. So uh, this goes back to January of last year. The Strategic Initiatives Committee was asked to look at um, ways to fund the lead service line replacement programs. Um, and at the most recent meetings, we looked at um, a couple of different proposals that came in uh, in response to our the village's request for proposals, one of which has a different business model than the typical design build uh, traditional way of doing um, a project like this. And this is called the, um, the uh, it's a community-based public private partnership or CB, I forget the acronym. We should just speak in plain language. What it does is um, uh, it, it's a partnership between the village and a private entity 
to fund part of it. And in this case, the way the private entity gets funding is by um, getting grants from the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, and the DNR as well. Um, so this lets us take advantage of these funding programs where we don't necessarily have the time or the capacity to write proposals. Um, so this is, it's just a better, more efficient way to get this huge undertaking, $40 million project estimated over the next 10 years, get it done in a way that's most efficient for the taxpayers in Shorewood and faster as well. And this one has some uh, really interesting components um, as well as being an infrastructure project. It's also a public health project. The North Shore Health Department is involved in designing the project as well. The ultimate goal, of course, is clean drinking water for people that live in Shorewood. And so uh, the committee looked at these two proposals and we recommended um, going with uh, community infrastructure partners who's done uh, work like this using this model uh, up, up in Wausau and has a lot of experience and had a really impressive proposal. Um, all the committee members watched the um, interviews. There was a, another meeting we had to go and in, go into further depth uh, last week. So, um, you know, this week we're going to discuss with the board about um, having the board have the strategic initiatives committee negotiate a contract with uh, uh, community infrastructure partners to get started on the project. There's a bit of urgency coming up with grant deadlines and uh, th that's why we're hoping to get started soon because there's, you know, there's only federal funding for five years, two of those years is already gone. So it's it's really important that we get started. And that to the process, the committee would be involved in um, developing the contract, but that would come back to the village board. So right. the action we're taking is non-binding. It's it's not a final action. It's just a procedural moving the um, to the next step. Is that correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. Manager Ewald, is there anything that you wanna add in terms of what we should take into consideration this evening? Nope, not at this time. Okay. Well, with that, I would open it up for, um, to, oh, Trustee Ersink, you were also on the committee. Is there anything you want to add? No, I would say uh, Trustee McGovern said it all. Okay. Thank you. So with that, I would open it up to questions from the other trustees, um, or if there's any um, comments that staff want to make, um, or a motion, if, there, if you want to get something on the floor to debate. <laughs> Yes, I I saw a kind of motion from Trustee Lynn and Trustee from our Lynn. corner. Yeah, from your corner. <laughs> uh, I just I, I apologize. I was not able to make that meeting last week. Can someone refresh my memory about the timing here? I know I see um, intent to apply is due October 31st. Is that relevant to this having this contract in place? So like if we were doing our con conventional method. How was how would this be impacted if we were doing our does this change it if we're using this model instead of our conventional go out for bids? So the the DNR timeline for that funding stays the same. What's different with this particular situation is that we don't have capacity to um one of well, let me back up. CIP has expressed the desire to submit an application on the June 30th deadline and request the DNR to review that. Um, so they would be trying to um, exercise an option to be eligible for funding um, for 2025. And it, it's, I'm trying to remember before we came up with this alternate funding model, were we, what year were we planning to start? Let's when we thought we had 20 to 30 years, were we thinking starting in 27? So when it, we, well, we have been, we did it last year. We, we'd show it as a part of CC phase one and CC phase two, the bids came back too high. We deferred doing lead service um, replacements right. this year and then said, we're gonna put together a combined program, which we actually see later on the agenda. Um, and then in 2025, we'll have lead service replacement on, on the public side of Lake Drive coming back to do the private side um, the following year. So we've had conceptually some ideas of how to proceed, but nothing that has been locked into place. Because um, as you recall, they started um, providing the new lead and copper rule and then amendments to that rule. And it's still not finally approved. It doesn't, uh, we don't anticipate final approval of the rule itself until October. And so then that gives the other states directions because the states 
typically their DNR is going to then create their own administration process for how they're going to um, review applications and administer the funds. So the soonest we could get money, the way the funding is right now, we're already in year two of a five-year federal funding cycle. Is that correct? Correct. 24. Correct. So we got 25, 26, 27 that we could get money from this BIL. Correct. We're in year two. So they've issued one year of funding. And so far, Shorewood has none of that. Correct. Okay. And so do we have access to the, the only thing that worries me here is, um, that makes me hesitate a bit is, you know, we've, we've been told all about Wausau. Wausau doesn't even have a shovel in the ground yet, do they? I mean, they make it sound like we have this great, we've got this great track record in Wausau. And the truth is, we have no idea how Wausau's because they haven't even started. And so I, that kind of advertising, that promo kind of bothers me because it's, the lack of transparency there is sort of troubling. Um, but what have we got to lose? We, we owe no money. We get, they'll do this for free, right? They'll do, they'll put in this um, application. Well, I, would, I wouldn't say, number one, I just want to let you know, I hear you with your concern that lead service line replacement in this volume is just new. It's new because now it's required. So I think we're all grappling with that. So the points you made are well put. Um, number two, they are paid, right, for replacement of the private. So it's going after the funding is not free, but it's going to be included within the cost per lateral. Um, but they do, they are proactive and um, aggressive in terms of going after the funding. And so how early would the village of Shorewood be required to pay CIP or would, would the money totally not come into the village coffers? Where would I see that on the financials or would it all, would CIP take the money? Would they give it, like, would the residents see a payment? Would the CIP pay the resident? How would, how would the money work, you know? So my, and this is my preliminary understanding, and again, we're going to get into the review of the contract, but um, the short answer is CIP does not get paid until their projects are done. Now, recall when they go in for funding, there's two types of funding we're going to be looking at, one lead service lateral and then the second water main, um, because with each- I'm sorry, the what other water main? Water main. Oh, okay. Because we can't put on all these new lines in some of the old mains. So we start from the presumption that whenever we're going to do the work, that that line is going to need to be replaced unless we evaluate it in a different way and can find another mechanism to help. Like, like, like a liner. Correct. Um, but even with that being said, um, the advantage of having those two applications submitted is that they, while they have two different tracks in their review by DNR, the you still have the opportunity to um, have the project be raked for the low interest or lower interest financing provided by the state through the state water loan program. Did I answer your question? I guess I'm just, maybe it'll come be clear in the, when the, we'll get a chance to read the, an opportunity to read the contract. Yes, absolutely. If, we, if we could get a copy of the WASA contract too, yes. that would be helpful just to know. Um, I just, you know, I actually, I think I've sent that out before, but I will put that in my Friday update. Okay. Um, so that you can have an opportunity to review it. So we would not have to pay any money until a lead lateral would be put in and that would not be like, is this a budget? Is this a budget concern? So for 25, I think what you're going, um, to see is number one, it's dependent on getting the funding. Right. So first we submit an application. They don't tell you right away if you get the funding. You don't find that out until later in the year. Right. So if you if you apply in October of 24. Their intention is actually to submit an application by June 30th. I'm sorry. Of I'm this, sorry. Oh, no, yeah. it's OK, said, because the timelines yeah. are confusing. <laughs> um, it may also be possible that we may and likely that we would submit an ITA for submission next summer. Um, so in October, the way the DNR works is that in October, um, an intent to apply is submitted by the municipality, and then you follow up in June, by June 30th, the following year with the full application. For the following. Correct. So that would put us in 20. Correct. I'm ready to make a motion. I would take that. 
Um, I move to have the Strategic Initiatives Committee develop a contract with CIP to provide an LSL and water main replacement program using the CBP3 model for consideration by the Village Board. Second. All right. Any discussion? Okay, I can say that I've been in all the meetings and following it, so um, I support the work of the committee. I know, Trustee Lynn, you were in the meeting as well, so... Um, no good I mean, this is, we have few options and this is the best path. For mm -hmm. us. So. Shout out to President Biden for getting this done for us. Mm -hmm. All right. And also for making us do it really quickly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. uh, hearing no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Moving on to the consent agenda items. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Motion by Trustee Ersing, seconded by Trustee Lynn. Um, any discussion? Yes, Trustee Stokrian. I'd like to please pull item A is in Apple, B is in Betty, and D is in Donna. Okay. Um, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda with the exception of 5A, 5B, and 5D. Uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Moving on to item six, items removed from the consent agenda, 5A, presentation of accounts. Trustee Stokebrand. I have two quick questions. Uh, the payment to Cairo Communications, is that part of the 70,000? We had a I think the first year we paid fifty thousand. The second year we paid twenty. Is this a continuing payment, or is this part of that last twenty thousand? It um, is actually for some additional formatting work associated with their report and the resource guide, which was added later on. So now we're done. Correct. Okay. And my other question is about um, our new uh, finance company. I asked about this last time, Lauterbach and Amen. Am I saying that correctly? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I noticed we're paying here for April. Did we figure out yet? Did we pay them for that last week of February? You're going to see that come up on the next statement, I believe. Okay. And thank you for reaching out on that because it was the missed invoice. With that, I will move to approve the financials. Second. Second. Motion by Trustee Stokebrand, seconded by Trustee Lynn. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 5B, consider Village Board meeting minutes, May 6th, 2024. Trustee Stokebrand. Uh, on item six, uh, presentation of accounts, it's related to what I just talked about. Uh, I asked about the payment to Lauterbach and Amen. 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 <laughs> next, next week, I'll get it. Um, been paid for their March work, but add, if we could please add, but their work began in February. We won't make it clear what the concern. Yes. And then um, I'm thinking we must have the wrong date on item. Excuse me. Um, village manager report, August 3 will be the tentative date for the finance department to present their data to the board. I think that's a Saturday. So. I will double check the date. Okay. Thank you. Otherwise, and with those amendments, I move to approve the minutes of May 6, 2024. Is there a second? Second. A motion by Trustee Stokebrand, seconded by Trustee Lynn. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 5D, consider Shorewood Improvement District's 2024 Criterium Special Event Permit, short-term cabaret licenses, et cetera, June 21st, 2024. Trustee Stokebrand. Oh, yeah, I just would like vote separately on this and I'll abstain because of a potential conflict of interest. All right. Would you I'm happy to make the, the motion okay. for it. Mm -hmm. um, I move to recommend the Shorewood Bids, Shorewood Criterion, Special Event Permit, Temporary Cabaret License, and Application for Temporary Class B, Class B Retailers License on June 21st, 2024 to the full board for approval uh, consideration. Second. Motion by Trustee Lynn, seconded by Trustee McGovern. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And one abstention. So Pat, motion carries four um, to one. Four ab zero. And, one. Right, four zero with one abstention. Thank you, a little brain freeze there. Public hearings, we have none this evening. Item eight, citizens to be heard. This item, item is for matters not on the agenda. I don't believe we have any uh, resident citizens to be heard in person. Um, I don't know if we have any on the um, virtual platform this evening. Not that I can see at this time, no one's raised their hand. All right, thank you. So moving on to new business, 9A, the EAB program, Emerald Ash Borer Program Review and Consideration of 2025 to 2027 service levels. Um, this item, did it go through Public Works? I forget from the memo. Okay, it's coming directly to us from uh, Director Bushlick. Um, it was pretty clearly laid out. Um, it was nice to recall how long we've been working on this, but how far we have to go. Um, and so I would ask if there are any questions um, or a motion to get things um, started, unless there's something you would like to say. Oh, there is something you would like to say. So I'm, I'm just going to kick this off and then I'm going to hand it off to um, Ben Habonic, who is our services foreman and Stuart Corte, who is our forestry leader. Both are ISA certified arborists, mm -hmm. which and we're lucky to have two on our staff. Mm -hmm. um, just as noted in the memo, um, the, the village used a 2018 WDNR urban forestry grant to update our tree inventory, and then also take a look at our emerald ash borer management plan. Um, and, and the consultant did an assessment of that plan and made some recommendations going forward. You may recall that um, in 21, um, the, the village board then agreed to fund an accelerated ash removal program for a period of three years. 2024, this year, is the last of that three-year period. At the time, we said that at after that three years, we would reassess and develop a new set of recommendations or goals going forward. Those goals are laid out for you in the memo, um, but Ben and Stuart are going to quickly review some of the highlights of um, kind of where we stand today, what our goals are, and, and what we're looking to achieve over the next five years. Thank you. Oh, that's right. The PowerPoint came later, so I apologize for... Um... And what I will do is I'll share my screen that has your PowerPoint on it. And then um, and just remember to talk into the microphone. All right. So we'll start with just a, a nice picture of what we have right now in Shorewood for our trees. So we have about uh, 6,400 street trees and park trees, making up 30 different uh, genuses. Uh, the three largest genuses make up 63% of our overall population, which is not very, very diverse, but um, that's kind of results of what nurseries used to supply and, you know, the generation before us, that's what they planted. And now when we have a pest come that targets one specific Venus, we have to, we have a, a, a large problem on our hands and that's what's happening with ash. They make up 16% of our population and if they were not treated with um, the pesticide we are using, every single one of them would be dead for the most part. And there might be some genetic outliers or something like that that might, might survive. Um, so our ash population is 1,000 street trees making up, um, so there's green ash, white ash, and European ash. Um, they all have, they all are more or less susceptible. Well, they all are 
the subject. Uh, right there, right there. Okay. You got to be right into the back. Yeah. So as you can see in the slide there, so you know we've got a little under 1,100 trees, uh, ash trees remaining, um, and slightly under 800 are under active treatment, and that basically means that um, they're either a white ash or a green ash. Um, those are the two species that we will inject. And then um, of those specimens, these are the ones who are healthy enough that we're confident that they can benefit from the injection. Um, there are trees in poor health um, that we could pump them full of this stuff and it really wouldn't do anything. And then there are also trees that are below the size threshold um, at which we inject. It's just currently 12 inches. Uh, yeah, you can slide. But yeah, Ben addressed uh, quite a bit of this slide. Um, our current management plan is injecting any ash tree that is 12 inches or larger, well, any green or white ash that is 12 inches or larger. Um, amamectin benzoate is the insecticide that we are using. It's really the only one that is effective um, and anybody who injects ash trees more or less is using that one chemical. Um, we divided the village into three sections and each uh, one of those sections gets done every year. So it's on a three year cycle. Um, it takes about three weeks every year. That's getting shorter and shorter with uh, our aggressive approach to removing. The more you remove, the less you have to inject. Um, do you wanna do construction? Uh, so the current policy is that anytime we have a major infrastructure project that involves the replacement of the curb, I will remove selected ash trees based on these criteria you see here. And that is essentially any, any ash tree with a condition rating left less than 50%. Um, that's largely a subjective look. We take a look at the tree and if it's in poor condition, there's no point in letting it hang around. Um, we should take advantage of the cost benefits of having it done as part of a capital project. And then, um, all European and green ash um, diameter of less than 24 inches are removed automatically due to this policy uh, if there's curb replacement. Um, so in 2019, following that assessment, um, the board approved accelerated ash removals. And since that time, uh, we've been contracting out 75 additional removals per year. This is above and beyond what we're doing in-house as part of our normal forestry operations. Um, and I, like she said before, this is year three. Um, so, you know, we've got 150 done so far and the contractor is in the process of working through the final year of that three-year program. All right. So, um, yeah, so now we're three, three years into the program and we have now taken a look, um, seeing what other municipalities have done, how the infestation has evolved and changed. So um, we are now proposing, um, well, the goals that we are, are trying to achieve are reducing the ash population to less than 10%, which is our goal for any genus. Um, um, reduce the time and funds dedicated to the ash treatment. Uh, eliminate ash trees, which now grow, uh, which may grow into the treatment eligibility size range. So that's removing small diameter ones so they don't reach 12 inches and then we start injecting trees that we really don't want in our population anyway. Um, uh, maintain a replacement schedule which allows for the purchase of bare root trees from bulk nursery. So there is uh, one nursery that we've been going through recently um, but they require a certain dollar amount to buy which is quite large for a, a normal year for us but since we've been having 75 additional trees, we've reached that and the quality has been quite great and the price per tree is significantly, significantly lower. So um, by continuing an aggressive approach, it allows us to continue to deal with that nursery. Yep. And then plant, uh, and then we're shooting to replace all the trees that we remove within one calendar year. And as of the past few years, we've been able to do that. When I first started five years ago, we had quite the backlog. There was a year right before I started where we didn't have funds to remove 
dumps. The uh, either way, uh, the past few years we've been reaching that, and that feels good. And the residents really like seeing a tree in in front of their house. Um. So, um, let's see. All right, so uh, updated management strategy is to continue proactive uh, accelerated contract removals, but we're proposing that bumping it down from 75 to 30, which over a three-year span would be 150 contracted out trees. And we usually give them larger um, diameter trees because they have much better equipment to do that efficiently. We we do not have that large equipment. It's, it's incredibly expensive and specialized for us just doing removals for you know, two months of the year. Um, add proactive accelerated staff removals. That would be on our end, and that's on the, we would be addressing those small diameter trees that we are hoping to not um, get to that 12 inch diameter. We've started that this year, but we'll do that as a, in the future. Um, infrastructure project removals, then take that part. Um, based on what we know now about the way ash trees are responding to treatment and the way the borer is impacting the ash population, um, I, our feeling is that the, um, the original construction policy was not aggressive enough to be in the best interest of the tree population. Um, and so um, we're proposing that all ash in these areas are removed at the time of construction. It's a really efficient way to kind of overhaul the species species makeup of a given area. Um, you end up with a little bit of canopy, you know, additional canopy loss, but it kind of takes some liability off us on the back end. Um, oftentimes when we get a, a big, High impact construction project. You know, we can keep trees up and feel good about it, but they it takes them three, four, five, ten years to die from the effects of the construction project, anyways. Um, so it's probably in the best interest of this program reducing the ash population um, to just remove all ash trees in these areas that are experiencing curb replacement. So that's a be a very quick, effective way to get this done without further taxing the in-house forestry staff. Um, exceptions could be made for exceptional trees. Um, you know, there's certainly, anytime we have a rule like that, you know, we can go out there, analyze what's there. If there are certain trees that really do warrant preservation, we're gonna take extra steps to make sure that happens, keep them out of the program. Um, and then while all of this is going on, we still have our standard forestry operations and that, in, that is gonna involve the removal of a given number of ash trees over the course of the year, just through normal disease, defect, storm damage, power strikes, things like that. Um, so we're still gonna have removals taking place. Um, just as a matter of fact, that's inevitable, um, but these other recommendations would be on top of that. All right, so our, our, last, our final slide is kind of the actual numbers involved. So, um, as of January 1st, this, uh, this coming January 1st, there, we estimated there should be around 962 ash trees with what we're removing this year. So um, we have the large tree contract removals. We have 30 times five because this is our five-year program. Uh, the small tree, the small ash tree removals that we would do as, as form of the aggressively removing, that would be another 150. And then the standard removals, like Ben was just saying, car strikes, storm damage, those trees die at some point, living organism. That would be 100 over that time period. So at the end of five years, we would have 562, which would make up 9% of um, the overall inventory of trees. And that would put us below our 10% goal. That meets all of our programs. Thank you very much, Trustee Ersing. Uh, you know, thank you for the presentation. You guys are awesome. You know, uh, what you do is really fantastic for our community, the care, the dedication, the passion you put into 
our urban canopy, the trees in our community. It's just so fantastic to see you guys out there, see you guys working, see all those little trees planted. I, I remember being part of these conversations early on and being a big proponent of the aggressive removal of our ash trees. Uh, it's really hard to see a big, beautiful tree disappear. But once you know what we have to do to keep those, those trees alive, um, and and to under, also understand that the quicker we can get a new canopy replaced with different um, species, uh, it's going to make a world of difference. So I'm really you know really grateful for everything that you're doing for Shorewood, and it's not going to be seen now, but it's going to be seen in, in 10, 20 years when these beautiful trees are are mature and we have a, a reestablished uh, diversified canopy. So uh, fantastic work! Thank you so much for everything you've done. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Other questions? Trustee Stokebrain. Um, if I recall, Leanne found a, got a great grant for us from the DNR, something to help with ash removal. You, we're applying. Okay. And so we don't know yet if we're... Oh, okay. Um, so then I'm just wondering, in terms of the in-house removals, 30 per year over five years, and the contractor removals, 30 over five years. How does that compare with the way we've been doing it these last three years of this? Is that, because um, I know at one point it says we're gonna decrease the accelerated program. Yeah, uh, so uh, the past three years we've had 75 contracted oh, okay. per year. And is the in-house yeah. number the same? In-house, we have only really been doing um, our strikes oh, okay. really poor. So it was out. mostly the contractors that were and, doing it. Yeah, not until this 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 removal season have I begun to remove small diameter ash trees. I've started at like the 12 inch diameter, 11 inch diameter, because those are the closest to moving in. The ones smaller have a few years till they encroach in that to that 12. So um this is that's the first year that I've um so it sounds that. like this is going to this requires an increase in staff time. Um, this plan than what you've been doing. I that. I would not say that. I okay. would say uh, within my five years, what I picked up there was a large amount of what I saw as dangerous trees that needed to be removed immediately, and I don't feel that way anymore with the current population of what's out there. That gives me more time. If I have two months for removals, that two months, three, four years ago was dealing with dangerous trees. Okay, so it's a that shift of months, a yep, shift. Okay, can be ash geared now. Good, and I the overall number aside from the staff number, it, it seems to go down forty thousand dollars per year over five years. I think we've been paying seventy five to the contract. Yep. Thank you both for your work on this. Yep, welcome. Thank you, Trustee Ersing. Uh, I'm ready to make a motion. Thank you. Uh, I move that the village board adopt the EAB management strategy outlined above for the 2025-2029 period, including the funding accelerated contract replacements, and that staff be directed to implement the outline level of service strategies. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Trustee Ersing, seconded by Trustee Lynn. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Um, next new business item. Oh, apologies. Please. Consider resolution 2024-07 to remove certain streetscaping elements of the previously approved threshold per privilege permit issued at 4075 and 4115 North Oakland Avenue. So this item comes to us from Director Gushlik. Um, All the materials were in our packet, including a map with a visual of the structure in question. Um, and you'll recall that this is a, attached, or it's um, adjacent to the um, design conversation we had about um, in preparation of replacing Oakland Avenue. Um, Director Bushlick, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, I would I would just add the reminder that the removal of this bump out was one of the recommendations identified in the 2020 um, transportation and parking plan. 
Mm -hmm. um, so that was incorporated into our engineering and design work planning for Oakland Avenue. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I recall that was discussed and um, supported by the board at that time. All right, any questions or a motion? Yes. So uh, I move to uh, move approval of resolution 2024-7, a resolution to remove certain streetscaping elements of the previously approved special privilege permit issued at 4075 and 4115 North Oakland Avenue. Is there a uh, second? Second. All right, motion by Trustee Ersink, seconded by Trustee McGovern. Any discussion? Trustee Stokebrand. Uh, I'm just wondering because there's a lot of feeling in the community that there's a disappointment in the way the building fits into the into the neighborhood. To remove streetscaping without requiring any new streetscaping, I think we I would don't, don't want us to lose an opportunity here to take a, a situation that many people are not happy with take out the, the few things, some of the few things that would, that soften the abrupt appearance of that large space on, you know, one of our busiest thoroughfares. I would like to see this go to parks and open spaces for some recommendation, or if, um, I just, I, I hesitate to take away requirements that soften that building facade without requiring something else. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, after just a brief conversation with uh, Director Butchlick, uh, the shade structure, there's a chance that that could stay. And that's really the only thing there that, I mean, it's it's kind of useless, um, you know, but it's it's really the only thing there that could stay in this in this sort of approach. Those planters would have to be removed. Could, could, the, they pla be re could the planters be reconfigured? I think they could maybe be pushed back or, you know, moved around, but... Um, if I may, um, I can understand the, um, I appreciate the opportunity to consider what would take its place or what it would look like without those um, planters and taking into the consideration the um, discussion in the community. It seems to me that we would need to, we need to take this action for ADA purposes. Um, and so, by uh, determining whether there is an alternative, it's private property, am I correct? So we wouldn't be able to require anyone. Um, you, you are absolutely correct that the, the, the existing planters will encroach into the public sidewalk when that sidewalk is returned to its original intended location after the bump out is removed. I cannot speak to um, any of the other my understanding is that the action that's necessary is a revocation of the granted special privilege um, to add a, a condition that didn't exist prior. Mm -hmm. um, I would defer to your, your counselor, your village manager, as to how that impacts your previous development agreement. Mm -hmm. It would also mean that we would have to defer this because it is agenda for the for this. So the only action we can take is on the item as presented this evening, um, as to whether we would be able to change this action to require something in exchange, um, would be a question for the attorney. Would you like to go? Uh, the best answer right now is it depends on a lot of things. Most importantly, the language in the microphone, please. Mm -hmm. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Uh, it depends on a lot of things, which is the the wonderful lawyer answer. Most importantly, on the language of the agreement, and then as well as any governing ordinances regarding cityscape in general. No, you cannot dictate what people do on private property, but there are certain exceptions to that. Mm -hmm. So there may be um, language in the developers' agreement, but that would be a completely separate action and and process. So the only option is for tonight. Yes. Are you ready for him? We have a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a motion so, in a second. Yeah. So guess, any other further discussion? I guess I would favor de the deferral of this because um, we need to make sure that this is an opportunity that's it's going to make the space look worse and without advocating for a more pleasing aesthetic I just, I think like we would almost makes the first mistake worse. 
Yeah, it's not public space, so we wouldn't be able so to. So isn't it a pub? The sidewalk is a public right of way. Mm -hmm, but we wouldn't place anything in the. We have to have a sidewalk. So I'd, I'd code aside, um, all we can, we can see if the motion on the floor fails. And if that fails, then you can make a motion to defer. All right, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Oh, it's a resolution, it's a roll call, right? Mm -hmm. The roll call vote. Trustee McGovern? Aye. Trustee Lynn? Aye. Trustee Stokebrand? Nay. Trustee Ersink? Aye. President McCaig? Aye. Motion carries 4-1. All right, thank you. Oh, man. I am. Sorry, I'm having a little sleepy computer issue. <laughs> I can announce the next I one. I would appreciate I... that. Go um, for it. Consider professional services agreement for 2026 Lake Drive Lead Service Line Replacement Program Engineering. Uh, so this item comes to us um, from a previous meeting where it was deferred and um, action was taken to obtain a second uh, quote and Kapoor, which was the um, recommended contractor, um, came in lower. And so it is before us recommending um, to enter into a, to, to award the contract to Kapoor. Director Bushlick, would you agree with that summary? Is there anything you'd like to add? There is not. Okay. So with that, are there, um, Trustee McGovern, do you have any questions? I believe this preceded your turn. Uh, no questions. All right. With that, I would uh, take a motion. Uh, Ersink. So I move approval of a professional service agreement with Kapoor in the amount of seventy-two thousand six hundred ninety for engineering, bidding, construction, management, and inspection services related to the planned two thousand twenty-six Lake Drive lead service line replacement program. Is there a second? Second. All right, motion by Trustee Ersink, seconded by Trustee Lynn. Any discussion? Trustee Stokebrand? Is this is this could could this be affected by the lead service programs that we talked about earlier tonight? I mean, once um I don't believe so. So the 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 bipartisan the the bill funds are targeted to identified neighborhoods that have to classify as disadvantaged. Um, as you might guess, th those funds are not eligible for use on Lake Drive. Thank you. Good question. Further discussion? All right, this is not a roll call, correct? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, five zero. Let's see, uh, D, consider natural turf management update and review of future direction. This comes to us from Director Bushlick, so please, I'm glad you're staying at the, <laughs> it's the Leanne show. Um, uh, the memo that was included um, is pretty straightforward and I appreciate the creative alternative. Um, are there any questions or anything you would like to add, Director Bushlick? Um, I don't really have any, thing to add i so ben who you now mm -hmm. are well acquainted with um is really the the it was his idea to um kind of come at it from this slightly different angle so that we can achieve the objectives that the village board set out previously for natural lawn management um and he will be the one who will be responsible for you know organizing um renting the equipment making sure that that those items are taken care of and scheduled by our staff. Um, we believe that that then is going to make it significantly easier to work with lawn care service providers if we're only talking about mowing, which I think will drop the prices there um, and, and give us some, a bigger pool to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I said, it's an incredible alternative. I really appreciate it. You can really see how our staff is um, advancing in expertise and really willing to um, collaborate to meet the needs of a growing, changing environment. So it's impressive. Yes, Trustee Stokebrand? 
So from what I was reading, if we take over the natural lawn care, is that just aeration and the milorganite application, or is there more to it than could we buy a piece of equipment? What I if we're gonna start doing aeration, is that the piece you'd have to rent? Uh yeah. So you the, can pull that up so you don't have to. There you go. The uh the the mowing is one element of the program and that needs to be done at specific mowing heights to kind of make the whole thing work. Um, and that's no that, big deal for a contractor. Right. Change it, mower blade. There are probably a lot of different contractors out here, out there who can handle and show a competitive interest in performing that work for us. Um, the natural lawn care, the, the, the turf care portion of it um, involves uh, core aeration once or twice a year, kind of depending on the exact service level of a given area. That needs to happen at very specific times. That needs to be coordinated with stakeholders, user groups, such as the Little League. Um, and my my expectation is that by renting that aerator, um, I can get that done very quickly when it needs to get done to minimize conflict with the user groups. Um, another component of that program is um, malorganite application. Um, that is something that um, could be done in-house through rented equipment. Um, that, that equipment is a little harder to rent, but I think I can figure it out. Um, the other thing we could look at is simply piecemealing that that service, contracting that out, just a more organized application. Um, it's possible that that could work. A third component is the uh, top dressing with compost, and that's something that should coincide with core aeration. Uh, those are the main things. So that, we don't have our own aeration equipment. Correct. We don't. And we don't have an, the uh, uh, milorganite application. Correct. So if we take this on, I don't see, is that something you'd think you'd wait, like do it, see how well the rental works out the first year. And if it doesn't work out very well, we you might come with a proposal to purchase that equipment. Um, my recommendation would be that we make sure that bringing those services in house work out well. Um, Make sure that it make sure that it does in fact work out the way that I think it will. Um, if if that is the case, uh, I would recommend in the future looking into purchasing that equipment. Um, but that would kind of there's some there's some side costs to that. We'd have to maintain it. There's a lot of we need right. a place to store it. Um, there's things like that that we have to deal with. And so you're comfortable with the current staff levels taking on this? Yes. Thank you. And by the way, do we do all the school? Does the school do their own? Uh, school district is totally separate. Thank you. Question, Trustee Ersing? Yeah, um, so as you said, if this works out, you, this would be something we'd be uh, taking in-house, but at the same time, you know, I think our current contractors probably, you know, left a lot to be desired as far as this, this, um, this, is, this kind of field is concerned. Um, would you also be kind of like investigating other contractors to, so you could potentially not have to do this in house? Uh, what's that like that balance of wanting to do it in house versus finding the appropriate contractor to to continue this? Um, well, my feeling is that um, with the previous contractor, the results were generally satisfactory, um, mm -hmm. and that more recently it has been a challenge for me to satisfy um, the requirements of the program as I'm instructed. Um, while also satisfying the needs of the user groups. And so this was sort of compromise, you know, look at it as what, what can we do differently here that might change this. Um, the one thing that I'll say is that when we put out the RFP, you know, as we did earlier this year and as we did um, a couple of years ago at the previous contract, uh, if you're only getting one or two contractors who can even express an interest in it, um, there's not a lot of competitive desire there um, mm -hmm. that tells me that, you know, maybe, maybe we should look at some other way. Got it. Um, and that's kind of why this idea kind of came about. Thank you. And if I can remind, um, that's what we're being asked to is to take action on this proposal as presented this evening and any future discussions we would have um, at a future time, as far as the, what would happen perhaps next year or the year after. Yes. I can make a motion. Thank you. Uh, I move that the natural turf management tasks be separated from the turf mowing contract and be performed by staff in 2025. 
Further, I move that staff be directed to contract a minimum of three vendors or contact a minimum of three vendors to negotiate proposals for turf mowing services in 2025. A second. All right, motion by Trustee Ersing, seconded by Trustee McGovern. Trustee Stokebrand? Could I, one more question. So I keep seeing more, quote unquote, sustainable yard lawn services when I walk around the community. Can you explain to me why do they not want to deal with the government? Um, do they have a different idea of, you know, sustainable versus natural turf management? It, you know, it's kind of like a hot thing right now. And so I find it odd that we're nobody else wants to bid on this. Um, I'll let Ben chime in when I'm done. I think from my perspective, there's probably two two issues there. One is um, those services may not work on the scale that we're looking for um, and or we're not plugged into the right vendors. Um, we've We've been working at this for many years, so I doubt it's that we're not plugged into the right vendors. I think it's a scale issue. Um, like it's easier to do a residential lot. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and the other item is, you know, our, our program, and you may recall from our RFP is very detailed and highly specific. And it, it is possible that vendors take a look at that and go, Nope. Um, but, you know, that evolved over the years that we've done this. And, it, and it's highly specific and detailed for a reason, because we know exactly what we want and we know the parameters that the program needs to run. Um, but that may not be appealing to everyone. I guess in the future, I would just be sure to reach out to Conservation Committee because they have a lot of, you know, good resource people who might know some might be interested. And I think that's a, a further discussion that we could have at the committee level, perhaps. I mean, I, I welcome more information, but it's it's kind of out of scope of what's the the motion that's on the floor this evening that we already have on the floor. I would just add one last thing that mm -hmm. um, ever since I decided to run, I, I get a lot of people talking to me about this. It's really popular in Shorewood and um, not something I expected to hear a lot about, but I hear about it all the time. Maybe people have seen my lawn and they know I'm not that into mowing, so... Um, but it's it's really, I think people appreciate what you guys are doing. All right. So if there's no further discussion about the motion on the floor, I would ask that we take a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. And my device has gone asleep again. Consider policy 45 um, for donations. This is item 9E under new business. So this item comes to us from community and business relations. Um, the chair is not here tonight, but I think it came with a unanimous vote recommend recommending that we um, consider and adopt this donations policy. And this has been a couple of years in a good night, a couple of years in development. Um, and so I wanna uh, thank Manager Ewald for doing that work um, with all the stakeholders to move this, to present this this evening. Are there any um, comments you'd like to add for us to, okay. Um, any questions from the board? Okay, Trustee Stokran. I just had one um, possible amendment to consider the item that talks about, um, sorry, my, my laptop died. Donation anonymity cannot be guaranteed. I would add comma and is not encouraged. It's in, I think it's important for residents to know who's giving money for what. And I think that if we put that kind of language in it, it gives it a little more gravitas. Okay, thoughts, response? Is it necessary to say that in the policy or is that just more just a pr procedural thing to, to say not encouraged? I, I mean, I don't, you know. Well, procedure would be like the steps that people go through to make the donations. I would say, is it a written versus unwritten policy? 
probably would. Or would so I could you just prefer to see it codified. It is sets the tenor. Trustee Ersink? I'd hate to uh, deny money from anybody in the community that's willing to support some of our projects um, uh, because they're not willing to put their name uh, attached to it. So I wouldn't be in favor. Well, they're of already, already you have to have your name, right? So by- So, so we're just saying, yeah, so that also just in, in, encourage people to- This is important to us. The the reason why that that um, one line about um, being anonymous is included there is just because I recognize we work in the world of public records, right? So if someone's submitting me to me the form and they're requesting to meet with me, they're obviously it's going to come through our system. So I can't, I I need to be compliant with public records law. Mm -hmm. um, that's why it was there. Sorry, maybe I'm not understanding, Trustee Stokebrand. Can you just elaborate what you mean by by this? What's it, what's the goal? As, as I said before, I think it just makes it very clear to people that they are dealing with a government organization. It's taxpayer funded locations, uh, and it's um, it's something that we would encourage transparency. I, I mean that make that makes total sense. I I just don't think I I don't see it, see it need to be written here. Um, I'm happy to just go with the motion as it is and the policy as it is. But yeah, I mean. That's what I would feel more comfortable with. I think the um, the sentence as it is, is an instruction um, and because of open records law, so. You can request any records about donations that you want. Mm -hmm. um, if I may, I'll make the motion. I, I move to approve policy 45, donations to the village board. Second. Motion by Trustee Lynn, seconded by Trustee Ersink. Any further discussion? Hearing none, um, this will be, is it a roll call vote? Because it's not an ordinance. Okay. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Motion carries 4-1. 9F new business is consider policy 33. Attendance and training for volunteer committees and elected officials. So this comes to us from Manager Ewald. Um, there, can I go on? Um, this comes to us from Manager Ewald with some additional information. Um, and would you like to summarize that for us? Sure. So yeah. initially when this um, was brought to you, it was important that we have a way to track um, volunteers and um, in observance of the training that they were taking to make sure that everyone was receiving the training. Um, at that time, we had talked to three different people at NOAA before, all of which said, no problem, we can handle it in our system, you know, because there, we're not pushing training out um, through, through them for cyber or random programs, but we would actually be creating the content and put, just putting it through the system so it would track. Um, so similar to the cybersecurity, you know, once every 30 days, you know, training will go out, person would be, you know, requested to take the training, and then we just continue to go forward. So we didn't have to track things individually. Um, they have come back to say, oh, no, sorry, we, we can't do that. Here's the cost for doing that over the course of the next three years. Um, and then provided that estimate based upon 125 users. So wanted to bring that back to you um and then uh, policy number 33 as it was discussed previously this has been at committee and discussed with the board so um, the committee previously had recommended um, changes to the policy um, to include the requirement of training and that that be um, reviewed annually uh, similar to how our attendance is built into that policy um, and then flag. So wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, the revisions to the policies, all of those things have stayed relatively the same. The difference here is the board needs to make a decision as to whether you want to proceed um, with paying for the cost of no before to track volunteer training. Um, if you don't, you can say that you're going to require it, 
Um, we don't have an ability to track that um, amongst all of our volunteer members. So I think, you know, it's really a decision point for the board. Um, we got to this place in terms of the training requirements because of some issues that we encountered um, with lack of training um, on our, our boards and committees commissions over this last year, um, which resulted in time and expense from this group. So that's one of the proactive things. I actually thought it was more of an opportunity. You know, once we had that, I thought that was a great silver lining um, from going through some of those discussions with all of you. Um, because the reality is, you know, volunteers aren't doing this every day. And um, while all of you have gotten, I'm sure just from being in this room, have gotten more astute in terms of Robert's rules and how we move through a meeting, I think really people genuinely want to know how to work within the parameters. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we want them to do good work and give them the um, this educational base to do that. Um, because any member of this community should be able to serve um, and do so in, in a good way. So that's what I'm bringing to you tonight. Um, if you move forward with it, you have money um, to cover this within the scope of the village board budget, either from training or your contingency line. Um, but wanted to bring that to you because I would need some action on it. And then I would prepare the final documentation just so I set it up correctly and then put it out. Thank you. Um, was there anybody, it was at, which committee it was, was a while ago? I want to say community and business relations or yeah, so JPNL. Maybe, no, no, it was JPNL because it was a Lynn more balled off motion. Sorry. I'm sorry. Wow. I don't know how. To... <laughs> um, Trustee Lynn, is there anything that you want to add to the um, consideration? It, no, I mean, I, th I think it's a really good idea. I mean, I just think, you know, we rely so heavily on our, on our boards and our committees. Um, and I think they, for good reason, I think they provide really good support and and really help our government function properly. So um, I think just ensuring that everyone's on the same page, at least, at least at and some base level, I think is really important. So I, I would be in favor of um, requiring the tracking of the training as well. Okay, Trustee Ersing. Uh, I also, re I, I'm also in favor of that. I think whatever training we can do for our volunteer groups is incredibly valuable. Um, you know, just, you know, this weird example that I have and it sticks with me, but it's also very a valuable sort of experiences. You know, I do a lot of volunteering for different organizations. I coach a lot. I coach for baseball. I coach hockey and this hockey training that I have to do every year to be a hockey coach is incredible. It's like the, the, I've never taken so much training in my life for one particular thing to be a hockey coach. I have to like, it's like, you know, eight hours of watching, you know, videos and you have to click through these videos. You have to like respond. You have to take quizzes. There's safe sport. There's all these different elements that I have to do just to be a hockey coach. And I'm, you know, and I'm kind of shocked that like baseball or these other programs that I do, there's not that level of sort of requirement. So I think having something like this just for our, our, you know, volunteer groups, is kind of maybe the bare minimum, but I think it's also very valuable to to sort of, you know, track um, if they're taking these these you know this this program. Uh, and um, I think it's I think it's actually really really important. So I'm in favor as well. Is there anyone who would like to make a motion, and then we can have further discussion? Trustee Happy Lynn? to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, um I move to approve amended policy number 33, attendance and training for volunteer committee and elected officials and track training completion through no before, expending half of the expense through the village board contingency in 2024 and budget for the remaining half in 2025. Second. All right, motion by Trustee Lynn, seconded by Trustee um, Ersink. Uh, any discussion? Yes, Trustee Stokebrand. Um, just for clarity then, is this like, like the no before that helps us not be hacked correct because they because they're using the village um communication platform right correct and it would also be about things like robert's rules and open meetings mm -hmm. so it's a very it's a comprehensive yes okay with what we can find and what's available so one of the things you know i are tracking right now is i had asked the league and i'm going to be asking them again <laughs> um so it's not a no, it's not a platform we're already used. Cause I it, thought that would make it simple for you. No, it no before would be the tracking mechanism, but oh, okay. the trainings themselves would be from those that are already provided in the state. Some of which are antiquated, right? So I, I'm not, I'm not, this is not going to be 
watching one of Arthur's productions. So that's the, one of the downsides. So but one of the, the 5,900, does that just include the no before? Correct. No, it doesn't include the content. No, that um, we actually already outlined. Um, and I took that from existing trainings that are available from um, UW extension that the league provides. The league also just um, came, it's not live yet, but they did update um three or four different trainings that they're going to release this year. So as they update trainings, I'm going to be inserting the more updated version back in. Is there a cost for any of these trainings? Not from the league. Okay. Um, but I, I really, I as I've said to the league before, I, in conjunction with the league and our insurer, who which is also a member, you know, of the league program, I think this is something that they should produce for all elected officials. Um, so like we'll need to take it. Yes, you're included. And so my, I'm in favor of this. I just think we need to be very transparent on the application to be a volunteer. I think we should put, oh, you will suggestion. be required to do two hours of training. You will have 60 days from your appointment or 30 to complete it. If you don't, you will, your app, you will be removed from your committee. I think we just have to make it. It's a great idea. So the policy hasn't been in effect yet. So, um, We'll go through that process and I'm Once happy to passes, do that. And we can look at implementation. Right. And then, so you think the 5,900 just for the no before, and then whatever we need to pay for any content, we can cover it from that fund that you outlined. Correct. Oh, okay. And it would be, you're going to start this. I'm just saying it seems really ambitious and I appreciate your ambition, but June 1 seems, well, so I already have the trainings and everything outlined. I think it's just the process of us pushing it into number one, getting this done with no before contractually, and then pushing it into the no before system and then rolling it out. But, but it can't happen if we don't take action to that. Correct. And it can't yeah. happen if it fails. And you know what? If it's, you know, 15 it's days late because of something, right. I... I hope that everyone would understand that we're trying right. to create something kind of out of nothing, yeah. but that it's, I think it's really good. Yeah. I think this is going to be really helpful for people. I honestly, I mean, I don't know about everyone else, but I think like a two hour, if you could keep the training, are you looking, is that the kind of window you're thinking or? So what, what is nice about the no before is that they can send it out in dosages because what we know about, this is one of the reasons why we're here is that we used to do a training once a year and have people required to come and do that training here. And we would do it in person. So was that before? I don't remember that. So I know. So it's, it's every year we do it. And since COVID it's, you can barely get anybody there, you know, and it's not a, while we say people need to go to the training, um, there's no um, consequence if they correct, don't. you know. So, and it's not that we're trying to be heavy-handed by any means, but what we are trying to convey is that we want people to volunteer. We want you to use your skills, but there are rules, legal bounds, and there's an that these groups have no differently than you as trustees. But and so we need for them to learn what those are and and use those within the course of their decorum at their volunteer meetings. That in a box in bold type at the top of the application form. Yes. No, thank you. Cause I had not thought about the application yet. Right. So this will be new information you know, coming out, but I think if, if people, you know, not you use the word liability, everybody will understand. Yeah. Right. And, and I might add that if this um, policy is acted upon tonight, um, once we have a policy, if mm -hmm. there are ideas about dissemination and implementation and communication, those can be forwarded to the village manager mm -hmm. because they don't require action of the village board. So we're going to see how it goes, mm -hmm. but I, I promise you, you won't, well, you may regret it, but you won't regret allowing people to have the right tools in order to do the good work that they want to do. Plus, we have the benefit of having knowing a consistent what the message everybody's receiving is. Right. Yep. So we'll go through it for a period of time. So you're going to have to hang with me for a year if it passes. If so it passes, we might want to let us take action and then okay, sorry. reassure. <laughs> I'll reassure you later. <laughs> Maybe because if it doesn't pass, okay, th there's really no point in telling okay. us. <laughs> so with that, if there are no other questions. 
that about the motion on the floor, um, then I would ask for all those in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? So motion carries 5-0. So Mayor Jirwal, would you like to finish your sentence? <laughs> in short, I'm excited. Hang with me. We're, we're, we're growing. And I imagine together. you'll give us updates on how the implementation is going in the village manager's update. Sure. Okay. And um, you'll know because you'll be getting all the same training. It, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. As, as I said, if you have ideas that are um, related to implementation, please forward those to village manager. All right. I believe that was our last item under new business. Is that true? All right, so the next item is um, President's report. Um, we did, we have two proclamations and we did one earlier this evening and the second is for the men's chicken barbecue. Um, and Trustee Lynn, you're a member of the club. I am technically, yeah. Would you like to read the proclamation? <laughs> yes, I would. Okay. Um, <laughs> Whereas the village of Shorewood enjoys the reputation of active and engaged civic groups that seek to make Shorewood a wonderful place to live, work, and play. And whereas the Shorewood Men's Club is a community organization founded in 1956 as a way for the men in the village of Shorewood to meet, enjoy a little camaraderie, and support worthy village organizations. And whereas the Shorewood Men's Club is making the village of Shorewood great by contributing to local charities and organizations. And whereas four times each year, the Shorewood Men's Club hold funds, holds fundraisers in the village, these fundraisers allow the club to donate over $10,000 annually, which goes to charities and organizations which benefit the residents of Shorewood. And whereas one of these fundraisers is the annual Shorewood Men's Club Chicken Barbecue. Now, therefore, I am McKeg, president of the village of Shorewood, do hereby proclaim Saturday, June 8th, 2024, as the Shorewood Men's Club Chicken Barbecue Day. All right. We'll see you all there. Um, and just a side note in the village manager's update, um, uh, manager Ewald uh, recapped the ICC meeting that was last week um, around the adoption of the new member materials and onboarding. Well, actually, uh, the new member materials. Um, and I would just like to thank you, um, thank the village board for um, taking the previous actions because really the obstruction to taking the action on the new member materials was over the word equity. Um, the, there were members of the ICC that could not tolerate um, the word equity being included in the materials or defined. Um, and if we had not taken the previous actions, um, I wouldn't have been able to say that I'm here on behalf of my community and my community expects that we would adopt something with this definition of equity because it's a standard definition and that it was also in alignment with the um, Milwaukee County. Um, and so having that um, made it more of a issue of our function as elected leaders in that room rather than as personal people with politics and backgrounds and, and coming from different places. Um, so without that previous action and and commitment, I wouldn't have been able to do that, and we wouldn't have succeeded in moving that forward. So I just want to just make that, that comment. Um, and at this time, I'll hand it over to reports of village trustees. Committee liaison updates or committee reports got one this evening? For the Conservation Committee. Mm -hmm. um, Conservation Committee just had the pollinator palooza Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, at Estherbrook and good good turnout. I, I missed it, but it was, um, from what I heard, a good event. And then, uh, as you know, we've had No Mo May going on. Um, Fox Fix did a story on it. And that's uh, just kind of showing the popularity of, uh, you know, Shorewood kind of setting an example for the larger community. And that's something that came to us just from somebody in the community came to us and asked for us. And, you know, over the years we got, um, you know, we got permission for from staff to not enforce the code temporarily for a month. And now it's, you know, it's, it's become something that's grown. And it all just came from, uh, you know, someone coming to the meeting asking um, if we could get something going on that here because he had seen it in Appleton. So 
I just think it's a nice example of um, some of the work that some of these citizen com communities can do that actually helps out. Wonderful. Thank you. Any other updates, reports, liaison? All right. Village manager. Um, I actually have a number of things under my report tonight, mm -hmm. which doesn't happen very often. <laughs> um, but a hyperlink to this packet, you're going to see the 2023 Village Department Annual Reports. Um, so click through those to, to look at those accomplishments from 2023. Um, I'm amazed at how much we get done in a year. Um, so it's good reflection point because all of that work is also supported by this board. So thank you. Um, then we have the volunteer committee annual reports as well, along with their 2024 initiatives um, that have gone through me for purposes of review. Um, those are also hyperlinked and on the web page. Included within your packet is the 2024 work plan updates for quarter one. So um, there's one thing, there's one future agenda item of consideration and that, that was left off because I think it occurred at just the last meeting. Um, community and business relations is gonna be reviewing our, our process and how we go through volunteer committee initiatives. Um, and then we're also gonna be incorporating that education within um, the volunteer committee trainings. Um, Moving on, I have been communicating with the board and the CDA um, to trying to schedule a joint CDA village board meeting. Took a look at those responses, um, and the day that has the majority of people available is May 30th. So you will have received an email today as well as an Outlook um, invitation just to get it on your calendar because it's something out of the regular meeting cycle. And then last but not least, wanted to call to your attention just for um, personal planning purposes is that the July 1st meeting is, there's not much happening for that meeting. Um, tends to happen a lot sometimes during those major holidays and how the winds of vacation cycles for um, different contractors or consultants take place. So right now we don't have anything scheduled for that meeting. Um, wanted to let you know that if it remains that way, um, I'll be coming to you then on June 17th requesting cancellation. Um, but I just, so I just wanted to put that out there as a, a potential. If you do meet, I don't expect it to be lengthy. Um, I would also add that last year um, there was a trustee that requested that we not meet the week of July 4th in the future. So there's correct. there was also that request last year from the board to consider so Changing given, that given how it worked out this year, next year when I do, um, when I lay out all the meeting dates for you and we have discussions about changes of dates, that's when I'll probably look to see how the fourth falls and then look to find a more, a, perhaps a better week in July. So then we would not meet for two because we only have one meeting in July and one in August. Correct. Um, can we legally meet on a different Monday? We meet on July 8th. I hate to go an entire, you know, we go from June 17th to August 5 with no meeting. I can I can tentatively plan for that. However, I, I don't know if that's going to change the content for your meeting. Okay. Um, I, I don't would, know if you'll have any items. But definitely if there's something I can, I will bring it to you and we'll take action. Yep, and then you can take action. My preference would be to not... We only have one meeting that month to give up that meeting, I think is. Um, no, we actually are scheduled for two meetings in July. No, just one. Oh, July 1st is the only meeting? Correct. In okay. July and August, um, we only meet on the oh. first meeting of the month. Apologies. Mm -hmm. I, I broke my own rule. No, it's It'll okay. come to us for consideration, and at that time, we can yeah. uh, determine. Well, legally, we could move it to the 8th. I mean, or we can yes, do but the I 17th? don't know if you're going to have any agenda or the following. That's what I'm. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah, but I mean, we can talk about the next meeting. I just wanted to give you a heads up, right? Because it's a busy time of year, and I I come out. I've started mm -hmm. to develop that calendar because you're more valuable here when you are doing things elsewhere, right? So I want for you to always. I, I want you in the community and on vacation and doing all those things because those help build your perspectives and your viewpoints, and it allows you to come in here and do a good job. And I would say any, now that we've had the heads up, um, any comments or questions, um, 
submit them an email and that can be brought forward to us as part of the packet consideration. So future. And that concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Um, but yes, please do um, review everything that's um, linked and attached um, because it is an incredible um, spectrum. Future items of consideration. We just, you mentioned that. Um, are there other future items of consideration, Trustee Stokebrand? Uh, I was speaking with Janet Henning recently, and it occurred to me during our discussion that we have not really looked at parking since we made all the changes. And I know um, public parking lots are on the list of possible affordable housing sites, and parking is a really big issue for bid coming up with the 2026 North Oakland Avenue redo. And so I wonder if the bid working with staff and seeking community out input somehow, if we could look and see, especially with an eye toward that 2026 reconstruction, what are we going to do? I mean, it's not just where are we going to put the criterion. Mm -hmm. It's like, where are all those businesses going to, mm -hmm. what do they think should happen? Mm -hmm. And before we, you know, I know we've already put the public parking lots up as possible sites, I believe areas of transition or whatever. Um, we need to talk to the business district and see what they, how they would feel. And it, it's also important because we'll have the new apartment building is up. The signature will be open mm -hmm. and um, the Atwater is open. We can, I think it's time for us to just look at what we did mm -hmm. and see if we're happy with what happened. Mm -hmm. So I would ask for a review of public parking in the village with an eye toward looking at, are we where we want to be, especially going into that 2026 construction? Okay, so um, is that something that we need to take action on? Because um, if so, um, we need a much more short motion to- I can try to be more concise. Mm -hmm. But thank you for the overview. Um, but I'm also wondering if it falls with any other initiatives that we have because we are doing a communication around the Oakland and we can, so sometimes with future items, it turns out that it's a village manager kind of update and report. Um, but we can, if you wanna make a motion to have it considered as a future item, um, we can do that and we can develop it from there. What I'd recommend with this one is that we put it with, um, there were two other items of a parking, but related to parking. Mm -hmm. um, one, which was not tackled with the transportation and parking study because it was excluded because we had a, a huge hill to climb just with the on-street permit, but that is daytime permits. Um, so that's something that is on um, the list for the PD to take a look at because this year um, we're gonna be in our last implementation step of that transportation and parking analysis, which was, um, the complete streets policy. So after that, we said when that concluded, then we would take on daytime parking. Along with that is also um, Trustee Lynn's item of <laughs> the RVs. recreational vehicles parking on the street for a period of time. I forget the- The yeah. Lynn motion. The, the, the Lynn motion yeah. that happened before. So we those are listed on for 2025. Um, I know I'm spraying in since 2020 because that's when that analysis was done, but that's kind of the trajectory mm -hmm. that we've gone. So proud of you. You've done a ton in the area of parking. You have changed the landscape mm -hmm. truly. Um, and so the last thing part of that was daytime parking. And because it related to that, um, I had I had asked to kind of tie that in um, to your future mm -hmm. item of consideration. So, so when we talk like about mm -hmm. parking that landscape, you know, the the PD, one of their, um, one of my requests to them this year was to, you know, every year have the same metrics and that they monitor for purposes mm -hmm. of parking. Um, Before we get my, yeah, to it, we are, hasn't been noticed. Right. Yeah, Sorry. So, so I think um, what I'm wondering is, could you do a sort of a synopsis of what that initiative would entail? Yep. Um, and Trustee Stokebrand can review it to see if it matches with the vision and the it meets the objectives. And then um, if it doesn't and you want to submit a future item of consideration, that it be listed um, under future items so that we have the language in place. 
my my question is about parking capacity and i don't mm -hmm. hear those words so right so we but because we can't yeah, fully discuss it because it isn't agendaed i think it's more effective to have um, manager ewald bring forward the information about what's planned you could add to it at that time um and so it it doesn't necessarily and then we bring it back and it's all the language is all here so we're not making it up on the spot that's what i would prefer it sounds like we're talking about two different issues though maybe but let's find out yeah what i heard from you was capacity capacity was detailed in the transportation and parking analysis so those numbers and that analysis has been concluded um i don't know what's current i want to I know we need more discussion which we are not this okay. isn't set up to that so i would really appreciate in the future to develop this and bring it back just with language so that the board understands what we're voting on. I can, and I, I can think, be more concise. I would like you to work with the village manager on that because there it is related to the tar parking and transportation study. So that's what I'm going to ask. It's, it's looking at what has happened since we since we passed that study and we passed that parking law is to look at how it's working out with an eye toward 2026 reconstruction on 20 on for the bid. I don't want to look at 2020. I want to look at what happened since then after COVID. Okay. I, well, I, we will develop that. And if it needs to be itemized under, if it needs to be agendaed under future items of consideration, just please work with village manager to articulate that. Well, and just for everyone's awareness, the bid is looking at that. I know. They, I they, have, a, that's they why have a committee that's been we are, with us. This is, this is a discussion. In, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We cannot, we need to stop this only, discussion. Yeah because this is not a future, it's not developed enough to be a future item consideration that we can take action on. There's outside information that's coming into the room. We need to have that presented as part of a future packet and an agenda. So with that, are there any other future items that don't pertain to other initiatives that could be involved? If not, I would take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any object objections? We stand adjourned at 9.05. 9.02. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.